Oh, happy Sunday, everyone, and welcome to my show, where it really is okay to not be okay. I'm Ray Bonney, a qualified counsellor, workplace mental health specialist, and not to mention a very dedicated and oftentimes enthusiastically disruptive men's issues advocate. It's not every girl's dream job, but hey, remember that men also matter. It seems that every month of my show, there's a special moment to commemorate, and today is one of the biggest days on the celebratory calendar, and that is Mother's Day. And we just heard from one of the greatest mothers going around, Michelle Cicardo, with her fabulous new show, Programma Italiana. Happy Mother's Day, beautiful Michelle, and to all the other mums out there listening in. Thanks for tuning in, and remember that my show airs live every second Sunday of the month between 10.30 and 12 noon. I meet with guests from all over the world sharing what it feels like being them and recognising that it really is okay to not be okay. Now, first ever, ever, Australia's first ever funded National Men's Health Strategy, and I did repeat that a few times because it's quite a shock every time I say this. It was recently launched, allocating more than $19 million dollars over the next decade to improve the health and well-being of every Australian man and boy. And thinking how this strategy and funding can best serve our boys and men, international photographer Lisa Hartnett and her high-performance leadership husband Rob have sacrificed their special Mother's Day morning to come and talk about raising three stellar men. Dispelling the stereotypical myth of snips and snails and puppy dog tails, we're going to discuss why sugar and spice are also lovely masculine attributes. Welcome big kids in their own right, Lisa and Rob Hartnett. Woo! Yay! Hey, hey Ray, how are you going? <laughs> yeah, very morning. well, thank you. And happy Mother's Day again, Lisa. And I'm sure, Rob, you do carry out some Absolutely. mothering tasks and, as well. Uh, yeah, no, full support for all the mothers out there, uh, the mothers and grandmothers, of course, that are out yes. there today. It's a fantastic day for everyone. Yes, it is. It is. And also remembering that it's not a fabulous day for many people. Every time we have a big event that evol involves emotion and uh, sentiment, there are a lot of people that don't feel or don't have families around them. So a big shout out to all of you people as well. And um, our thoughts are with you. Now, we've got a bit of a backstory. Small one. The small one. <laughs> we did meet over 30 years ago. I'm sure it must be over 30 years ago, way before any of us ever thought of having children, I'm sure. Absolutely. Because uh, our wedding anniversary is next week. So oh. that would be, that's 28. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, so it would be 30, over 30 years ago. Yes, because you were dating and uh, we were all in the yacht racing scene. Well, yeah. you, you guys still are. I um, departed a long time ago, but uh, I was working in the media then with Mike Sabi, and you guys were very connected into that um, more glamorous side of yacht racing. Yeah, well, I was uh, I was on the boat, and Lisa was um, photographing the boats, many, yes. many boats. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, in fact, it's really interesting when she was photographing when the days of film, Ray. So she was uh, having to take shots with film and all that kind of stuff and keep cameras dry. And today we've got the iPhone and motor drives and all sorts of things. And, that you can uh, throw it's, in, it's, in it's, the uh, water, yeah. Well, you just can do so many more things today, not taking that away from uh, the uh, the photographers of today. Because we might talk about some of them later on, but uh, yes. it was definitely a harder gig back then. Oh, absolutely. And I remember, I'm sure sure we purchased many of your photographs, Lisa, for publication. And I also remember, you know, driving out to Port Melbourne to meet a helicopter to pick up a, a film to drive out to ABC or SBS or wherever it was going to be uh, screened that night. And uh, wow, haven't we come a long way? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. But we've caught up a few times since then. Um, but I, anyone that looked at my social media promoting our, our show today, we'll see Lisa uh, on a rather serious motorbike and uh, and you accompanying her. <laughs> you guys haven't grown up really, have you? No, we try not to. So that was actually Lisa's bike, will not you? Is it a triumph? Can, yeah. Yes, it is a triumph. Mm. Is that something that's always <clears throat> been on your bucket list, Lisa? To have one of those bikes? Yeah. Mm. Um, yes, probably. I think there's a bit of a movie connection with that motorcycle and... Um, and, of course, I ride on the back with Rob, and it's yes. always great fun. Yeah, because you guys, are like, you love the water, but you also like the wheels as well, don't you? Yes, that's true. 
Yeah, well, about a couple of weeks ago, Lisa and I had the, um, we were up at the All British Rally up in, in central Victoria, and we read where the, the, the tour was going, and Lisa read, she said, oh my God, it's riding into Clunes. <laughs> we've got to go, we've got to go, because Clunes was the scene of where they filmed Mad Max 1. Yes. And so to ride into to Clunes, uh, <laughs> uh, a la Mad Max 1, um, with the, with the, with the, uh, the group. Of motorcycle riders, even though it's like 40 years later than when yes. the film was there. Lisa said, we've got to do it, we've got to do it. What a great thing to do, you know, ride into Clunes to the main street, just as they did in Mad Max 1 on, on motorcycles, which we did a couple of weeks ago. So another thing ticked. Wow. <laughs> Didn't know that was there. No, I don't think Clunes has probably changed in the last 30 years either. Well, it hasn't. It's, it's, uh, in fact, it's a great little city that's now, a little town, I should say, that's now embracing its movie history because Ned Kelly uh, with Heath Ledger was also filmed there. Yes. And because it's those beautiful wide streets and, and I think uh, it's a great spot for, mm. um, for filming. So it was great to, to go through the um, little township again and see all the little cafes popping up and it's a great Mm. place. Oh, well done. Well done getting out there and being adventurers and also, you know, we're going to be speaking about raising boys today because you've, well, I'm sure you haven't finished raising three of them, but (laughs) you're well on the way and, you know, part of that adventure and journey that you share with them, especially around... Who's who's is it Ben? Who's the motorbike enthusiast as uh, well? Well, all three of them are. Yes. So all three of them, all three of them rode. All yes. three of them had dirt bikes. Mm. Uh, ben was the more Ben raced. So we raced extensively yes. with Ben when he was younger, um, and he's the one with the motorcycle license. So um, yeah, they're, but they're all they're all uh, sort of keen, but have done more in sailing since we, uh, yes. you know, since probably Ben's age about twelve. We swapped mm. over. He went basically cold turkey from motocross to yacht racing, and uh, which is quite a quite an, an interesting step. <laughs> Now, Lisa, I don't care what anyone says about gender equality. I think, you know, biologically men and women are different and so are mums and dads. What does it feel like being a mum of three boys who are out there racing dirt bikes or out there in the middle of the ocean? Is that a different experience, being a mum? I think it is, but I think it also teaches them resilience and responsibility and... um, and, and terrifying at times too, of course. <laughs> you know, no one wants to see their child hurt or anything like no, that. No. And um, But I, I think it's important to give them those opportunities if you can. And we were able yes. to, which yes. was great. So do you play a bit of a tag team with it? So I know that with my boys, especially Rory, my youngest, his uh, dad has a property up at Mansfield with lots of motorbikes and guns and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very lucky in a sense that we're not, together that he gets to go and do all of those things out of my sight. I know they're happening, but I don't have to see them. Uh, it was a bit different with motocross because we were racing mm. um, and motocross is uh, the way, way it operates is that you've got to have uh, at least one of the parents or a guardian or support person actually do duty on the day because they need a lot of people when they're running a motocross event, a huge amount of volunteers and there's so many parents who are just wonderful in all sorts of sports, of course. Um, but because I would, Ben was so young and he was actually racing two bikes at the one time, I was with him. What, so, straddling two bikes? Uh, well, evil he, can evil stuff. Almost, <laughs> almost, but he coming from one race and pick the next one up. So that meant Lisa had to do the corner duties. And so Lisa is, hadn't come up with a motorcycle background like I had. So she had to do corner duties, which is basically having like 35 dirt bikes that are really big, ridden by 14-year-olds coming at you. And so that was... Uh, yeah, Lisa took up drinking, I think, during that period. Yeah. <laughs> On the corner. <laughs> yes, because each corner has to have a marshal. And then you look at that point as, and you turn your back. So you're not watching them coming at you. You're watching them riding away. And if anyone comes off or there's anything happens, you have the flags and you put a flag up, that a yellow flag that signifies that someone has fallen off or something like that. Oh. It's a really safety. So every corner has to have somebody on it. That's why, as Rob said, it takes so many people to actually run one of those events. Yes. So I was the person for Ben and... Yes. Terrifying. I'd there, I'd, I would stand there and they'd all fly past. And, I could um, just imagine facefuls of mud. Yes, being sp- that's true. <laughs> Had that as well. Yeah. So we did that as a family. I think there was a few times, uh, most times it was done as a family, especially because the, the, the uh, trips were away. But sometimes we would carve it up. So I would sometimes do events with Ben and spend time, he and I would drive the tracks in the country. And a lot of those, those trips, I think we've done them through sailing and also through all sorts of sports the boys mm. have done. Um, the family bonding on the trip there is, and the trip back is probably probably some of the best times of your life. Mm. The events are the events, and there's there's always stress or whatever you're doing when you're doing them, but some, I think if you even ask that boys, any kid, I think, enjoys the family trip or the family road trip, um, 
that we do. There's some some great times happen when you're co- cocooned in a you know a tin, but it be the car or otherwise, and you just have some absolutely wonderful memories during that. How many trips. games of I Spy did you did you play? Well, it was it was almost uh, it was almost like playing rock quiz with the with the music and all the different things that we do, and uh, you know you get to know the McDonald's between here and Queensland, put it that way. So the boys will almost know how many K's they had to go or which one was coming up next. So <laughs> it was quite but funny. But you're right. You know the family unit. You know they all come in all different shapes and sizes these days but one thing I think you can't deny is the connection. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and we've tried to balance that out between, you know, Lisa spending time with the boys at some point, or I might spend time with the boys. And that might be just having a coffee mm. or having a lunch or, and even that's really right up until now because they've all got challenges and things they're going through at different parts of their, their life. Um, and then there's stuff we do as a family. So we try and try and come together as a family uh, once, uh, once a week. Mm. Um, and, and just to do just and we actually do that away from the house because it's just it's just too many distractions so we usually grab you know go somewhere for dinner or somewhere uh this you know it's just we can get together and talk mm. um we're still carrying phones and all, all the rest of stuff um but we try and do that at least once a week and that's we find when we're away from the house it's much less distraction and they're a lot more focused on what's coming up what we're doing and things they've got and then we'll try and break it up as well between the both of us mm. No, that's, Do you think that's right, Lisa? Yeah. Yes, I think so. And also we try and always have dinner sitting at the table. I think that's really important. And we've got a round table, so we all sit together. And do you and all have your designated spots? Yes, we do. Yes. We do have designated spots. Yeah, so. okay. yeah, someone changed last night and it wasn't good. <laughs> I think that was me. <laughs> now, look, there's no bigger advocate for me than me for keeping families together and however those families are. And uh, I think you know, one of the things that I wanted to speak about today was you know, there's so much talk um, in the last many years about toxic masculinity, that's something, misogyny, and just mm-hmm. this whole global attitude that men should be doing better, better for everyone apart from themselves and being told what to do. And, um, you know, you couple this with the feminist complaint that women are still taking primary care of, of children. So what are these mothers doing to our boys then to make them into these kinds of men that we don't like. So that's where I go, well, here's another question to be asking. But, you know, already in the entree into our show today, we're talking about this thing called connection and togetherness, which is not a gender thing at all. Agree. Mm. Yeah, agree. Um, Yeah, it's interesting. We was, I guess you try and, I think as parents though, you you do reflect back a little bit on on your own parents, and you can decide whether you want to do that or don't do that, or there are good things or bad things. And and you know, I'm always a kind of a positive look. What can we improve, um, person? So. You know, you try and think back on those times, but also you're still doing it yourself and you're with different types of people. So, yeah, we get the toxic masculinity. Probably our youngest is, is probably really um, talks about that a lot, but he's, but he's has a how, two how ways of looking at it. it. Oh, he just, um, in a way, he kind of jokes about it, but he's also... And I think this is interesting because it's, it's a generational thing between millennials and Gen yes. Z, and definitely this the is Gen- Lockie. He's seventeen. Lockie, yeah, he's seventeen, and Finn is nineteen. But they're, so they're technically um, um, Generation Z. Ben is a millennial, yes. and there's definitely a difference between them. Uh, and even even with Lockie, even more so because he's just that little bit younger and still at school. Finn's now at BCA, um, whereas you know Lockie will talk about it and joke about it, but he understands it. But he also sees the the extremes. The, mm. the, you know, we're going too far sometimes. Mm. But he's uh, he's quite balanced, I think. In uh, uh, in what he sees and observes and uh, yes. and, and I think it's good like that, isn't he, don't you mm. think? But how, think so. does that affect the way that he interacts socially? You know, we see a lot of um, activity even you know, socially at schools where a lot of boys are falsely accused of certain kinds of behaviours and really affects them very negatively and families. Well, my point, there's an interesting one for them. So the boys, the boys, and one thing we should probably clarify for us, all the boys went to an all-boys school and still do. Yes. Uh, didn't initially. So um, they all uh, were at um, primary co-ed and then just in the senior senior year. So, and that was interesting because we felt, uh, we initially felt, Lisa and I felt that with three boys, we wanted to be in co-ed because we thought with a daughter and or a girl in the house, apart from Lisa and our beautiful Labradors, of course, <laughs> um, which have both been my Labradors and the boys adore, um, that we, you know, maybe that wouldn't get a balance. 
And it was actually Ben who called it out and said, you know what, I, Dad, I want to go to an all-boys school. And it was about the age of uh, 14, 13, 14. Yes. And so I we said, okay, let's try it out. And and he, he did, and we moved him, and he just loved it. And I just think there's a certain – and I don't – look, I'm not a specialist in it, but I do think boys and girls are a bit different at certain ages. And I feel the girls are a lot more mature than boys at about that 4, 13, 14, depending on your child. Um, so he felt it was a lot more – easy to express himself, a lot more easier to grow up in, in that in a school that actually focused on bringing up boys. So so in terms of um, being sort of falsely accused, they probably don't see that if they were in a co-ed school, that might be more obvious um, than what our boys would get, would, would see. Mm. But they certainly they certainly pick it out. And I think our boys are pretty are pretty balanced and, and I think it's been great for them to have co-ed and co-ed uh, at, at, at government schools uh, as well, because they've got a really balanced view of, of life. Um, and we've always tried to do that, that they, they know both sides of the street and both sides of the track and they're, and they're pretty good at, at judging that and also pretty good at judging other people and, you know, calling the bluff. <laughs> yes, well, absolutely, exposing your kids to as much experience as possible. It's true. You know, that's, you know, I feel is one of the, the keys to giving kids more balance and um, objective view of the world. How mm-hmm. do you feel about that, Lisa? I think it's important and I suppose I'm very mindful of what they're saying and um, I think also with their relationships with girls and, and um, I think it's really important to, to listen to their what they're saying, what they're talking about and probably to call them out if, if I f- – and my big thing is don't be a creep to, to girls and to women and I think that's probably how I've sort of tried to get them to – um, understand that girls are just like them. They're people. They have feelings. They have, um, you know, hopes, dreams, aspirations, and they're just like boys. Mm. But um, I think it's the way, you know, it's, especially in a group situation where yes. there's a lot of boys, and I think potentially that can go down a path that we don't want. Mm. We don't want it for the boys. We don't want it for the girls. So the big thing is don't be a creep. Yes, uh- and totally agree. Nobody should be a creep, and that goes to for anyone. girls too. That's girls right. can be creeps as well. So, but, but do you think the media continues to portray that um, it, it's you know it's boys that need to be taking care of girls, but there's not a lot of accountability for girls to not be treating boys in a way like, for example, you know we we just saw the outcomes of Thirteen Reasons Why, which is the Netflix series that mm, yes. portrays um, yes. suicide, and you know I'm I'm an advocate for suicide prevention and. Personally, I felt it was a really good production, but there is definite statistics from America that came out that the suicide rates really rose during um, that release in the in the in the couple of weeks after that. But what they didn't report was that the suicide rate of girls remained plateaued, whereas it was the boys that that um, escalated. And uh, the protagonist in the show is a female who dies, and it's all around you know the the blame the blame game of whose fault it was that that she died from suicide but very very gained focused on the fault of males and we're not recognizing in our boys like you just said lisa is that how they listening to how they think and how they feel from a masculine perspective boys don't always have all the words but they have a hell of a lot of expression we just need to know how to look for it that's true and often i think you have to be ready because sometimes they want to talk to you when they're ready but you're perhaps not you're about to go to bed it's 11 30 at night and then someone comes in and starts a conversation and you just know that you can't end that conversation you have to be present present in it Mm. and go through the whole scenario of whatever it is that's happened or upset or whatever so and I think that often happens a lot with boys that you have to wait for them or well, not wait for them, but and you try, and as Rob said, you give them the opportunity as well. well you got to be yes. observant too, and Lisa is brilliant at that. I got to say, Lisa is so good at at picking that signal, or even if the signal is not picked, and it's just, as, as and someone wants to talk to you, um, she's great at just kind of dropping everything and spending that two hours. 
yes. you know, or, or an hour or 15 minutes, doesn't matter what it is, to just listen um, and listen and coach to a certain extent and just uh, be there and, and be available to do that. I think that's the important part that there's always someone there available for you to, to chat to chat with and to talk to. I think it's a fantastic point you've raised actually, Lisa, because I think we do, you, we were talking about going out for your weekly dinner and, you know, the phones still come with you, but it's a time where there's less distraction. I think many of us aren't that mindful and with and we're going to talk about the impact of technology on um, these generations as well because we are very fortunate that we lived non-technically and then moved through the technical age and whereas our well, Rory I know my youngest he doesn't know life without technology whereas Rose and George they also had both too but the the, the appreciation for what technology brings to our life that's great but then also some of the habits we can slip into that take away from that really active listening and providing your kids and your family the feeling of being cared for. We can talk about it. Send a text of care. I love yeah. you. But are you really there? Yeah, being really present. And uh, it's funny, you, you brought back a memory, Bray, when you talked about 13 Reasons, where because Lockie, our youngest, was quite interested and very into 13 Reasons. But I've got to take my hat off to Ben, his uh, older brother, who literally binge watched it one night to ensure Lockie didn't see anything he shouldn't. Yes, um, he did. And he mm. binge watched it and came and, and then spoke to Lockie and said, great up until this episode number here. If you want to do the next two, I'll sit with you through it. Well, how I thought that was, that, yeah, because yes. Ben had researched it as well. And, and it's, again, it was done from good intent. I know the producers did it to, to prevent suicide. In fact, they just want to make it more aware. Yes. Um, and it was a fine line with it. And I know a lot, a lot of kids watched it, but I thought that was a really great point of Ben's to just, he just went through it and, and then, yes. yeah, came back. And, and that was better for Lockie as well, too. Because mm -hmm. Lockie said to me afterwards that he said, yeah, I'm really glad Ben did do that because there were some parts in there that I was confused about or I thought mm -hmm. things we kind of went off script a little bit or mm -hmm. what have you. And he's, he was interpreting things differently. And I think that's important. Yes, yes. I think we underestimate the, uh, the power of siblings as well. Quite often parents want to intervene between siblings and um, and try and work it out. But I feel really grateful to have, you know, Rose is almost 25 and George is almost 22 that, you know, they have each other's back all the time. They live together. They um, uh, There are so many things I don't have to worry about or interfere with because I know that they've got it. Yeah, in fact, sometimes mm, interference, you, you make it worse. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. and, and they get more affected by it. And I learned this when I was coaching the, the, the boys in, um, in sailing and in, and in motocross, but we always felt the other fathers would get together and we realised that actually we were pretty much useless. If we wanted something to change, we'd get the kid who was respected and three or four years older to yes. go and talk to our kids and say, hey, how about this? This is a bit of an idea. And our kids would go, go and do it, and then come back and go, oh, that's great. Jeremy just told me this really great thing. And we're like, yeah, awesome, yeah. <laughs> You know, but we, we realised that we were just never going to be, we we're going to be ignored, <laughs> even yes. though it might have made the greatest logical sense. Just step away. That's right. Step away. Kids are not stupid. They're not crazy. They're not. And if they're yours, they, they're going to be brilliant as well. But again, I don't think we um, ad administer that much um, trust and faith in the fact that our kids are smart and that they do know what to do and they do have good instinct. And if they're raised well, good morals and um, and boundaries which is really important as well. Yeah. But we were talking a little bit more, a little bit before about technology and the effect um, technology's had on our children of those, you know, later generations. You know, again, I've got Rory who's at one end of the spectrum and Rose and George at the other and I can see some distinction. But w what's your experience with the three boys? What do you think, Lisa, on, on technology? I think sometimes it can be... Um, a problem, as Rob said, about sitting at the dinner table and everybody's on their phone or, you know... Is it social media in particular or just...? Um, I it, think it can be. It can be social media. can, can be, be both. Um, and you just have to... I think you, you just have to work at what they're doing and, and talk about that because that was our big learning, certainly with, with Ben. And, and Ben now has, you know, one of the highest engagements in social media. Um, he's just clocked over 101,000 subscribers on YouTube for his um, his media business. He's a, he's a videographer and filmmaker. He's in Japan right now filming over there. Uh, he's, got, he's, he's run three Instagram accounts up to the tens of thousands because he's constantly engaging. And we were constantly at him for ages um, about, you know, his obsession with the phone. Um, 
uh, at the dinner table and you know responding all the time and put the thing down and you know we're giving him a hard time and 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 then we came across a couple of checks that came in for Google for his AdWords that were coming in. and then we said get back on the phone <laughs> hurry up and start carving the money out to us quietly building a career so at the dinner table. Well, the reality and, was Ray that was true and he was actually you know very much engaged in building a personal brand and building things up. Um, that we were unaware of and so and he was engaging and, and he has one of the highest engagements of connections with people because of that effort that he puts into it and so it was, you literally need to understand and I, I think social media less the biggest one I'm advising um, parents to be very careful of these days is gaming so PS4 and some of the unbelievable games that are out there the interactivity the, the amount of um, virtual reality that are there it's extraordinary but I don't think enough parents are actually sitting on the couch with their kids just watching what they're doing mm -hmm. because there's a lot of sinister stuff out there there's a lot of creepy stuff going on in there that your kids are um, there's bullying going on in a whole lot of areas online from all over the world there's some awesome great things too you know and, I, and our boys have always played games i've never sort of taken them off them um at all but oftentimes i'll sit and i'll sit and see what's going on and we'll chat and especially these days where it's really shifted from when ben was first doing it to now when they're all networked and they've got the headset on and they're and they network with people around the world um it, it can be good but as a parent you need to just jump on there for a while and, and, and see oh. what they're doing and what game they're playing and etc and be good role models and I think a lot of people don't understand that with gaming, it's addictive. And not addictive in, oh, I just want to play it, but addictive to the point of people dying. People, they, I read a story about a woman um, who was just so addicted, like gambling. We don't understand gambling as an addiction. That um, her baby died because she didn't feed it for days. She was literally just 24-7. And that's where the addiction comes in. And you're right to be able to manage something that's fun and entertaining and how beautiful to connect with people from all over the world as kids. How cool is that? It is, it is fantastic so to do it. It's yeah, amazing. but we just, and yeah. uh, as I said, that's one of the, the upsides to it and connecting with different people. And sometimes we find that uh, the boys will be home on a Saturday night, but they're kind of virtually home and that they're yes. all their friends are on and they're all playing a particular game and there's a group of them and they're all kind of together, but they're at home. It's kind of weird. Yes. Um, and I think that's really interesting. I think the other thing with gaming is the game makers themselves are, are pretty savvy. There's some fantastic business models with DLC, so downloadable content, and you can be addicted and you want to go to the next level. And I and I was literally talking to a, um, a speaker. I was on. A, we were doing a road show around Australia. Right, and he's from New York, and uh, and he wasn't across the downloadable content. But what he was across was his Visa card charges going through the roof oh. because his son was buying all the downloadable content yes. or, or going to the next level in whatever um, game he was playing. And he, my, my, my colleague was completely unaware of it, but unaware of what was happening. But I, and I said, don't give your kid a hard time. Just maybe jump on. And, and he, in fact, he did. He emailed me a week later and said, you know what? He, my son was, and he's a great, you know, we really get on well. We're a great close family. He said he didn't know that he was incurring all these costs. He was just going up the next level, you know. And so wow. they've had to sit, and they sat and played the game together. And he said it was a really great bonding session. So do yes. that. Jump on yourself and mm. have a crack at some of these but games. I think, you know, with technology, and I think we can all agree that technology evolves at a rate of knots. And we can't keep up with risk and safety at the same time. And Rob, you would know more about this than anyone as a high performance coach, um, especially in the executive space. That you know, risk is something that we tend to ignore, and we don't actually, you know, we, we attribute risk to, you know, um, safety only. Yes. But we don't attribute risk to uh, vicarious trauma, for example. Yep. And that's a, a lot of stuff that kids are seeing online. They can't unsee it. Mm. They can't un hear it and they can't unexperience it so once the horse is bolted it's very difficult for you to be able to retract a lot of that so you've you know i hope hopefully everyone's taking notes today <laughs> got your jotter pad out um to to uh, write down these little nuggets because whilst it might seem quite logical to many sometimes we just don't think and i know i've raised my kids on my own and with no um, parents or aunties or uncles to get that perspective from. So quite often I'm thinking I'm doing a great job and it's not until you look back and go, gee, I would have done that so differently. I could have benefited from listening to Rob and Lisa on 94.1 FM 3WBC on Mother's Day 2019. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we've... Um 
Lisa and I pretty much have done a lot of ourselves as well. We haven't had um, uh, yeah, input from grandparents and parents um, of ours much at all, mainly because Lisa's um, you know, passed away a, long t- a few years ago. Her mother was unbelievably supportive. Um, yeah, while she, she was, was around, she was incredible. And, mm-hmm. uh, and she would call the boys out and she was great as well too and uh, they loved her dearly. Um, but we're, we're pretty much, you know... Yeah, you've done it on your own, which is incredible. Look, I just I, see I, I also to want to just um, a shout so. out to the fathers of my children as well, who've also <laughs> had amazing input, and yeah. they're, they're terribly good dads. They're yes. just they're fantastic. So uh, I didn't mean to take all of them. No, 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 you didn't. But I, I just say that though. To, mm. There's a lot, a lot out there, a lot of people who even guardians. You know, so there's a lot of people when you're looking after the kids and raising kids, and we've got all sorts of circumstances foster today. Parents. And I think foster parents to people who are bringing kids in and and sh- uh, shelters, and I just, you know. It, Honestly, you've got to get some, some perspective in your life because yes. some people are, uh, are doing just incredible things, oh. especially um, with kids. And it's even harder these days not to be assumed that you're, you're this type of person or their person or you're creepy or whatever when mm. you actually have such great intent. Um, so, yeah, we just, yeah, you, a lot of times you just do what you do and you look back at it. And I remember talking to a, a, a quite well known. Um, leadership mentor and 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 coach and uh and he looked back at a book he wrote 20 years ago and he thought i'll do an update his publisher said do an update to it he said yeah i think i will i'll polish it up i think it's about an extra he said he reviewed it he changed 90 percent of the content and he said i'm just so sorry i just didn't know what i knew now back when i wrote it 25 years ago he said i thought it was pretty cool back then but i've just upgraded it and i think that's just life we, we, but also knowing we that in 25 years time he's going to look back at this edition and go mm. and go you know what <laughs> let's upgrade that one again yeah so we're constantly upgrading we're now speaking, learning, we growing. are. And speaking of people who have a bit of regret, um, if you're Australian, you won't be any stranger to a man called James Rain, lead singer of Australian Crawl. Now, you've chosen a song, Robin Lisa, which is a great one called um, Hoochie Gucci Fiorucci Mama. Everyone knows that. But James Rain came out on Facebook a couple of years ago and said, it's crap. <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's crap, but we'll do it. He said, I was 17 or something when I wrote it. Can you believe that? Well, I, I think the reason... It was reason, 1980. Oh, I think so. But there's an interesting, um, you know, you asked about the track. And the reason is it's an Australian crawl track. It was probably a last minute thing put on the album when they when they came out, their first album. Um, but we were both uh, down the Mornington Peninsula, actually not dating at the time. We were both down there. And I remember Australian crawl actually got signed to play at the Bleg Area Yacht Squadron um, by a very good friend of both of us, Jane Codger. If Jane signed them before to do it, before this really broke with beautiful people and the yeah. whole thing took off. And, and, and to James and Australian Crawl's um, uh, you know, great uh, credit, they actually agreed and played. And they were, they were taking off and, and they, yeah. they still did the gig. My God, it was so packed yeah. at the Bleg Area Yacht Squadron. There are more Sandman panel bands you've ever seen in your life in the <laughs> car park. Yeah, it was fantastic. And I think that song, because, you know, the boys, you know, David's obviously, and James still live down in Mornington Peninsula. Yes. Um, it's about that. It's about Portsea. It's about the, the yes. snow. It's about all that kind of stuff, about Mount Eliza. And so it's a lot of areas that I still ride around, yes. I still go to. Mm. Uh, and that's why we, we thought the song would be interesting. Well, somebody chimed in on that comment and said, this song has more relevance now than it ever did before yeah. and, I, and I listened to it through that lens and thought yeah. bang on bang the on. lyrics are still pretty cool yeah. <laughs> you're listening to 94.1 FM it's 3WBC and you're here with Ray Bonney and Lisa and Rob Hartnett we're talking about what it's like raising boys on this very beautiful Mother's Day and uh, the weather out there is reasonably good reasonably good for for May and heading into winter now I had a call whilst um, we were playing that beautiful song from our president here at 3WBC, Phil Edwards, to say, hey, Ray, did you not get the email? And you know when somebody says, did you not get the email, my kids would say, there you go again, Mum, you just read the the subject line and hopefully you've got all the information. Uh, One of the great things we get to do here at 3WBC is we broadcast the football um, on weekends and I can't tell you exactly which match it is, but at 11.30, Phil's going to be coming on air to broadcast whatever match it is uh, that we're covering this week. So our show is going to be cut a little bit short today uh, by half an hour. So uh, we might just get Lisa and Rob back for, uh, for a continuation one time if you'd be happy to do that. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Pleasure. Now, I did want to cover uh, with your boys somehow from all that mud and dirt biking and, and salt and spinnakers. There you go. There you go. Nice still, work. Still got it. Yeah. Um, they've turned out very creative. And Finn last week received quite, a, um, quite an accolade. Yeah, he did. Lisa, why don't you 
Yes, he did. Mm. His media film that he produced for Year 12 VCE um, was selected to be in Top Screen, which is where all the, the um, top screeners go. Yes, correct. <laughs> and uh, his film was um, named as a finalist, so there were 14 of the, um, you know, wonderful films that have been created by the Year 12 students across Victoria. And, uh, and they had a series of showings um, where they, or screenings, where they actually screened those 14 um, films across to various students um, for the, from the current Year 12 um, cohort who would go in, media students, and, the, and then they had the opportunity to vote. And Finn's film won the most popular. It was People's Choice. Wow. So there it was very go. exciting. Now, anyone cause who wants to watch it, I watched a part of it the other night. I haven't finished watching it. I know it's only very short, but I got distracted. You can go on his Facebook page and see it, can't you? You can go to Facebook page or on YouTube, yes. So, um, uh, which is a Hartnett Films. So if you search up Finn Hartnett or uh, Hartnett Films yes. on YouTube, you'll see a bunch mm. of his uh, short movies he's made and uh, and Paper Caper is the name of it. So Paper Caper is the name of the, of the short movie that, that won and won and got in the top screen and People's Choice. So yeah, it was a great, great little movie yeah. and big thing. Thanks to all the staff of the school who helped him out, who also acted in it, yes. and his and his classmates who put in just a huge amount of time when mm. all in VC and they're all busy. But it was a great job by Finn. That's fantastic. And uh, my show here today will be produced on YouTube by David C Chandler, my new producer, who's doing a fantastic job. Uh, he's a piano tuner by trade, wow. and went to school with my daughter Rose. And he's also very creative. And I thank him very much for producing the show. But um, I will put links uh, on that YouTube for Finn's work yeah, great. and uh, so people can just click through. But it's interesting because if we go back to our yacht racing days and how we met and I was working in the media, uh, my mentor who I received back then, who is still my mentor today, is David Mann from 3AW, Man About Town. Man about and, town uh, yeah. So David's always played a big part in my life and, uh, and has been an influence on my children as well. But recently David asked me to join an organisation called Entertainment Assist and we're the not-for-profit organisation that takes care of the mental health of people within the entertainment industry. So I was always, I'm always very interested to hear uh, about the early adopters into media and the arts, especially in school, and how expectations are managed. And I think we see this as quite an issue. Uh, we did research with Vic Cuny uh, back in 2015 at Entertainment Assist around the mental health of the entertainment industry here in Australia, and the results were quite alarming in uh, the rates of suicide, anxiety and depression, which really trump the... Uh, the population, the world population general statistics. So the work that I'm doing there as an ambassador and program director is getting into places to talk to people about mental health and how we can manage better, but specifically in entertainment, like the difference between being a conductor in an orchestra to that of a lighting or crew member at the Arts and Entertainment Centre, poles apart, same industry. But equal measures of pressure and lack of understanding around how to manage. So um, it's a, just another little link in that we have and hopefully your boys being creative are having a good experience of, you know, possibly making a living in that industry. Uh, yeah, I, they definitely want to and we've been as aspirational as we can and, and frankly, I think that's where it's at. I mean, I'm, I'm involved, as you know, in a fairly bit in business and, uh, you know, AI, um, technology, analytics uh, is where it's all at. And in my day, I went, I'm, I'm an accountant by profession, did a Bachelor of Business and postgrad and applied finance. I certainly wouldn't be going down that track now because that all the work I did and started my work at KPMG, that's all gone. Mm. Um, that's all taken care of by forensic accounting and, and uh, AI and technology, which is fantastic, by the way. Yes. Um, we're, we're better to have those people spending their time on more uh, interesting pursuits. Um, and so the creative area is a really interesting space. And so if you're looking about to terms of the future proof yourself, uh, creative thinking, creative thoughts um, is really important. In fact, you may have come across this whole push towards STEM, you know, the STEM of you know, science, technology, you know, um, English and math. Well, what they've discovered, this actually came out in one of the accounting magazines a few months ago, we've now changed STEM to STEAM. We've added A for arts 
and arts is for arts and innovation and creativity and thinking. In fact, just recently, a couple of my clients just did a fan. I looked at a hack day, and a hack day or a growth hack day is literally creative thinking. Thinking about what could we do, and a lot of my passions, you know, today Ray is around possibility thinking, being a possibility seeker, which is asking the question, you know, how might we rather than why can't we? And it's a big shift. And that's why their creativity is really important no matter what you do. And so our boys being in the creative space, uh, Ben, our oldest, is a filmmaker. It is a full-time job. He's filming in Japan as we speak. He's done great work. and He's, he's the Instagram. Uh, yeah, he's so yeah he's yeah got a fair bit on Instagram, which is Hartnett Media, so Hartnett Media on YouTube or Instagram, and he's built up a huge following uh, all around the world, globally around the world, um, which is just just wasn't around in our day, you know, it just was not there. But who even made 10 that happen? Ago. Who made that happen? I think he made that happen. I think that we inspired him, but but I think he made that happen. And he was doing it at the dinner table without you even he knowing. Didn't, him, so. You know, he went to New York for his for his um you know VCE trip. You know, and uh, ended up doing an Instagram gathering, mm. you know, at, at that age. It's unbelievable. Yeah. That's, um, Phil Edwards has just walked into our studio. He pretended he was going to be surreptitious, but uh, <laughs> hi, Phil. Well, who's playing today, by the way? Hawthorne um, and uh, the other Northern one. Territory Thunder. Northern Territory Thunder and Hawthorne. Yeah, in the w- VFLW. In the VFLW. So uh, stay tuned in, people, if you like a bit of the footy. And sorry to cut you off there, Rob. No, that's okay. No, so he was, uh, you know, it, even at that sort of um, post BCE holiday, he went to New York with a, with a good friend of his and, uh, and hosted an Instagram shoot live. And he, he, he had a whole bunch of people come into New York City who he didn't know because he'd only met them virtually yeah. and he hosted a photo shoot. And so he's been doing that since the age of sort of 18. Yes. Um, and, and that's using technology, but also being creative and but learning from other people. And I think that's the big thing with creatives. But I would say that creatives is also, uh, it's stressful. It's not easy. Um, and you are putting yourself out there. Like he's putting his name out there all the time. Yeah, there's good accolades, but there's just as many haters and hackers and people who are negative that are out there. So when you're in a creative space, um, there's, there's always sometimes looks a bit better than it really is, but there's always the stress of, is this okay? What do people think? What do people think of me? And so resilience is a, is a very but tough skill. But also the support that you've described as well is to have support around your children whether they're boys or girls in in how you raise them. But I Mm. think in particular, and this is a biological thing, that girls have a biological purpose. It's inbuilt within us. And whether we're highly conscious of it or not, we do, whereas boys don't. So you find boys that don't have good infrastructure around them, good support, good role models, and no purpose can get into a lot of trouble. Yeah, I, I think the purpose one's interesting, um, and Finn does a lot of filming for me. We, do, we actually just filmed a little, a little video um, for YouTube on purpose because I actually see a lot of people um, get quite negative about purpose and feel depressed about purpose because they haven't found their purpose and they're searching in life for it. Uh, my, my thing is, have, you'll have multiple purposes. Have one purpose, purpose go do purpose it. I. You'll grow and evolve, you'll find another purpose. You'll grow and evolve, you'll find another purpose. So really, uh, if you haven't found the purpose, don't get too worried about that. Just take action, do something, have something to look forward to, something to do, and you, it will come to you and it will evolve. So uh, yeah, I, I don't that's think I would idea. have thought 30 years ago that I'd be standing on a stage speaking about men's issues and suicide prevention certainly wasn't on my list of things No, to certainly do. in my conversations with you, it didn't come up. That's for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. Up in anyone's conversation. <laughs> it did, definitely did not. But I think that thing allowing our children or allowing ourselves, like you guys described as big kids, you're still going out there and you're still smacking it. You're still buying Triumph motorbikes and getting out there and having a go. So say, so, you know, there's a new purpose. And we reset, redefine and raising kids in that environment, you know, gives them the best opportunity to not be afraid to to think that they can rather than can't. I think the thing on the community, at least, and I've always done is try to get them to, to meet as many people as possible. And, um, you, know, you, you know, I do a bit of cycling and riding with the Knights of Suburbia, um, the well, group was, I do. Yeah, that was, I wanted to quickly cover yeah, that before sure. we finished because we did have Lance Pachoni on the show yeah. a couple of months ago. And uh, Lance is also speaking at my next event. Uh, it's not my event, it's our event, White Alpha Men's Health Awareness. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are... Um, We've got our event coming up and we've got uh, Professor uh, Tony Costello speaking, um, research, uh, uh, prostate cancer research, amazing man. Um, we've got also Jeremy McVean, who was on the show last month uh, from Movember right. and the Fatherhood. Yeah. Jeremy's speaking as well and that's uh, on the 2nd of August at Marvel Stadium. 
at 5.30. It's only $160 a head. Uh, we have very specific outcomes for the money that we collect, right. which goes straight to the Australian Prostate Cancer Research Centre for a range of programs. So I'll talk about that another time when we've got more time. But going back to Lance yeah. and your c connection with him with the Knights of Suburbia and Love Me, Love You Foundation. Yes. Yeah, and so just in through my cycling, but, but all my boys, um, um, yeah, especially Finn and Lockie, have um, spent time with Lance. So they know Lance, uh, spent time with him as well. So I think having that network and support, and they've all been to Knights, they know, they know the Knights of Suburbia, they know why I ride with the Knights of Suburbia because we do so much work. And, and that has just grown from like a great idea um, that uh, you know, Russell Lee and David Rigney, who formed it, um, had in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, where now 350 members were right across Australia. And there was social rides happening all around mental health um, and being happy. There's a racing team, a very, very successful racing team, a successful social team. And and it's just a great group that stands for something. There's a lot of cyclists out there, but but I found with us, we we, we do the cycling, but we also do things for uh, make sure that people are, are never alone. And all the, all the money we raise goes to Love Me, Love You, which is you know Lance's uh, foundation. Yeah. And, and Lance has been great with Finn and a number of the, the boys, hasn't he, Lisa? Yes, mm, very much so. Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, I, there's a couple of photos you might have said of myself and Lance. And Lance, honestly, if he ever turns up to a cycling event again and just wearing a singlet when his arms are the size of my legs, it's just ridiculous. So, Lance, please just put that hoodie back on. It's just crazy. He, he loves a bit of posturing. Um. <laughs> he's, he's, he's an amazing guy. And, he's got, and he also is a great speaker. So, it'll be a great event that's coming up for you. Guys. Yes, yes. It's so uh, I'm very excited, and um, and that very day I'll be flying back from the Gold Coast as I'll be speaking at the International Mental Health Conference this year, which I'm really excited about. That's fantastic. It's my well first done. big event with uh, Entertainment Assist, so yep. I'll be commentating on the entertainment industry in particular. Mm. So um, thrilled to be doing that, and so that's going to be a really busy week. Yeah, that's um, that. That'll be a fantastic week, and um, you know, when one of the first things that Lisa and I did, and Lisa just as a photographer, but we spent a lot of time and uh, sort of around those early early nineties, I think, Ray, we were doing a lot of filming and photography of rock and roll bands. So, um, when the music industry, so Lisa was a photographer, and I used to write for In Press and uh, and Beat Magazine and try and get those articles published. So it's kind of full circle. In fact, we we must have done so many concerts with James Ray. We were shooting with James when he was doing a lot of that. It was his only solo career yeah, at that point. Yeah. So everything's go full circle, doesn't it? It, do, it does, know? it does. And then the time, you know, you sort of look for like to, to where we are now and um, go, wow, it's been, it's been a great ride and uh, we've got plenty more Ks left in us and uh, yeah. to achieve more. So I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and, uh, and donating your very special Mother's Day. What, what are you doing for the rest of the day? Well, Really, Lisa will be just relaxing. So um, the boys and I are, are planning to clean the house um, to get all things done for her. We're going to take her out for a wonderful lunch. Um, the boys have got a fantastic card they've written and a couple of presents. I know they've got those because I know they're listening to this and that what they'll be doing now is scrambling around very quickly to get that organised between the trip from here, the studio, back to the house and have that done. So Throw that everything was quick, in the cupboard, that was guys. A quick if you, move, boys. To, if you're listening in. <laughs> and so I haven't got your wind looking after you. Well, I had a very lovely morning this morning. Rose, my daughter, she does the Mother's Day run to raise money for breast, ca breast cancer research. And my son, George, is a chef out at Oak Ridge Wines in the Yarra Valley. So you can imagine it's a very big day big for day, him. Yeah. I will not be seeing him. Um, but he did call me last night. We had a really lovely, lovely chat. But uh, I got up early this morning, as I always do. And eventually Rory got back and said, Got, got up and said, go back to bed and pretend that you didn't get up. <laughs> so off he goes and he'd gone out with his big sister last night and they'd acquired whatever they needed to. So I'm in, in bed and in the kitchen, I can hear hammering. I thought, mm, but that's just not a great sign. So then he comes in with the traditional Mother's Day tray, which we've been using forever with the traditional fare, which is smoked salmon, cream cheese and capers on Turkish bread. So he'd managed to toast it, but what he'd, the hammering was to get the lid off the capers. Uh. So that's where that came from. And the entire jar of capers was actually on the tray and on the smoked salmon. <laughs> and when Rose phoned me later, she said, oh, did he get any capers on the, uh, on the bread? And I said, there were capers everywhere. There was not much of a surface that did not have a cape on it. <laughs> but I, re I thought it was just lovely and, um, and I really appreciate those small things. And I think we're off to play mini golf now. Excellent. Oh, very good. Yes. Excellent. That will be yes. fun. Yes. Don't mind a bit of mini golf. It was going to be laser tag, but evidently Rose, Rose's legs are too sore. 
So yeah, I'd go mini golf over laser <laughs> tag, quite frankly. <laughs> now, before we go, my next show will be on Sunday, the 14th of April, and I'm going to be speaking with theatre star Josh Pitterman. He's a former member of the Ten Tenors and recently starred in the lead role as Jerry Goffin in Beautiful, the Carol King musical. And you may have also seen Josh perform in Cats, An Officer and a Gentleman and Hairspray. But he recently re- uh, released an album. Which is a big thing, putting it all out oh, there. Yeah. Um, and uh, that was with the City of Prague Philharmonic Orchestra through Fanfare Records. So he's um, on the road already now. So I'll be speaking to him in June from Sydney, from his event. And uh, he's also one of our amazing ambassadors at Entertainment Assist and uh, speaks very well on behalf of uh, mental health within the entertainment industry. And they are wonderful. I emceed a gig in Queensland uh, with the Ten Tenors and they were oh, unbelievable. Really? Uh, incredible, just amazing what those guys do. That was a few yeah. years back, so he was probably in that group at the yes. time. But they, if you haven't seen them, please do, as, as Molly would say, do yourself a favour and oh. go and see them. Well, I hope Molly is still saying that. Now, um, if what we've spoken about today has brought up any feelings for people, you feel a bit uncomfortable and would <laughs> like some extra support, don't forget, Lifeline is on 131114. Suicide callback service is 1300 659 467. And of course, emergency services is triple zero. So uh, thanks again, Lisa and Rob, for coming on the show. As I said, I'll be back at 10.30 on Sunday, the 9th of June, and uh, hopefully not clashing with the footy, but if <laughs> I'll read my emails in future. So remember, uh, it's really okay to not be okay, and just ask that question. What does it feel like being you today? We'll see you later.